Along with my day job running an investment business, I started Tinsley Park Talks, a global networking and leadership platform where I interview industry legends from finance to tech and great thinkers to notable celebrities. In these interviews, we discuss great ideas around investing, entrepreneurship, problem solving, and all other lessons of life. Welcome to another episode of Tinsley Park Talks. You might have seen David Rubenstein on the internet or on Bloomberg TV interviewing heads of state and CEOs from around the globe. David became quite the journalist over the past decade, in addition to being one of the most prolific private equity investors in the world. Mr. Rubenstein co-founded Carlyle Group in 1987, which today spans across five continents with 26 offices and more than 1,900 professionals worldwide. The firm currently manages over $376 billion in assets with three business segments and 520 investment vehicles. Prior to forming the Carlyle Group in 1987, David practiced law in Washington, D.C. From 1977 to 1981, David worked at the Jimmy Carter White House as Deputy Assistant to the President for Domestic Policy. He also served as Chief Counsel to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments. Among many other philanthropic endeavors, Mr. Rubenstein is chairman of the boards of the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, the Council on Foreign Relations, and serves on the boards of multiple institutions, including the World Economic Forum. He really needs no introduction. I am thrilled to have him join as my guest today. Welcome, Mr. Rubenstein. Thank you very much for letting me uh, participate in this uh, podcast. I'm uh... Honored to be with you. Same here, uh, David. So as an only child growing up in Maryland, what key lessons would you say you, you learned from your parents? Well, uh, as an only child, you tend to focus more on uh, probably solitary related things, but you probably spend more time reading or thinking and not fighting with siblings. So not having any siblings, I didn't have as many people to fight with, but I... Uh, you know, got had parents who were not college or high school educated. Uh, they were interested in my uh, getting a good education, but they didn't push me to get a particular degree in one area or another, uh, really. And uh, so I, on the whole, I had what I would call as a, a satisfactory childhood. I don't have any psychiatric problems that required me to go to a, a psychiatrist because of my childhood. But clearly, I had a modest upbringing, but not a poverty stricken upbringing, but modest blue collar upbringing. I, now, according to your mother, being a dentist is the highest calling of mankind. H how did you manage not to disappoint her when you chose a different path? Well, I told her many times that I thought I might get arthritis in my fingers and that I have nothing left to do if I was a dentist. Um, she thought it was a great profession because you got to be called a doctor. You didn't have weekend hours. Um, and she had a lot of dental issues. So she was always going to dentists. She thought they made a fair amount of money. But I just convinced her that I wasn't really good in medicine or, or, or science. And so probably I have to try something else. And eventually she uh, uh, thought it was okay. You also wanted to be a professional baseball player, correct? Well, and that was when I was six or seven, maybe even eight. But then I realized if you're Jewish, you probably have to be an owner if you're going to be in major leagues, not a player. So I realized as my <laughs> classmates and, and friends were getting bigger, I was not getting that big. So I was not really big enough to get into the, uh, you know, into high school teams or college teams. So I pretty quickly in the early ages realized that I should do something better than play baseball professionally. So you, you got your undergraduate degree at, at Duke University and subsequently went on to attend the University of Chicago for law school. Uh, what made you choose these universities? One, and would you say your parents advised you? Or did you have a mentor or other influential people that, that guided you in your selection of, of these top schools? Uh, I really didn't. Uh, my parents, because they didn't go to college, were not that familiar with colleges. They didn't really know one from another. And they weren't really in a position to help me with advice there. But nothing wrong with that. They just didn't have a background in that area. I applied to many colleges. I did reasonably well in getting into them. But Duke gave me the biggest scholarship. So I went there. I needed a scholarship. And University of Chicago gave me a full scholarship. And so that made it easy to decide to go there over other law schools. 
I, I remember in one of your interviews, you talked about that Duke scholarship having expired and he had to go back to renew it or something like that. Is that right? Well, I think what I had to do is um, it was a one year scholarship, as it turns out. So I had to uh, convince the financial aid people to renew it, which they did. My grades were OK and they renewed it. But um, it, you know, it wasn't a full scholarship and I wasn't one of the star students there. They had a program at Duke called A.B. Duke Scholars, which they still have, which are people that get full rides and they are the students who are likely to be road scholars or something like that. I was not in that category. I was a reasonable student, but not a great student. Got it. Now, after you completed law school at University of Chicago, you went on to work as a lawyer in New York City. I've watched several of your interviews over the past years where you claim not to have been a good lawyer, but had strong interest in politics. How did politics work out for you? Well, when New York City was going bankrupt in the early 70s, um, my law firm, Paul Weiss, was engaged to help with that. And I kind of saw uh, the work there being a kind of a mix of politics and, and law. And I was involved in that effort and I enjoyed it a great deal. And so when the project ended in about two years, I decided I really had a uh, great, greater interest in politics and policy than I did in the law. And so I ultimately interviewed for and got a job working on Capitol Hill as the chief counsel uh, for Senator by one of his subcommittees. He was then a United States senator running for president. Um, that didn't work so well because his campaign ended up not shortly after I joined him. But I later got an interview to work for Jimmy Carter's campaign in the general election of 1976. And as we now know, he won. And so I got my job at the White House at the age of uh, 27. And how did how did that job work out? What what was your experience during the, the Jimmy Carter days? Well, I enjoyed it. I worked around the clock. I was not married at the time, so I could do anything I wanted in terms of time. But I, uh, you know, I, I never took a day off. I just obsessed with working at the White House. I got to know President Carter reasonably well and other people on the staff. And I um, thought it was, you know, I couldn't enjoy anything more than I was enjoying that job. I thought Carter would get reelected. Maybe I'd be the senior domestic advisor in the second term and probably then have a life of being a lawyer, uh, lawyer government official the rest of my life in working and living in Washington. But as we now know, Carter lost his reelection effort to Ronald Reagan. I didn't think that would happen. I thought Reagan was too old, too conservative, too not substantive, but I was wrong. And so I had to go back and practice law, which is all I knew how to do. And I really wasn't that great a lawyer and many law firms weren't interested, were not interested in me. So I eventually got a mid-sized law firm to give me a um, senior associate position, not a partner position. And I did that for a number of years, but I realized pretty quickly that I wasn't a great lawyer and wasn't that interested in it. And so in 1987, I started Carlisle. Got it. Um, so great experiences. What I'm really interested in, in learning, and I think our audience as well, is how did you develop this resilience from, from you know, changing the career in politics and in D.C. to, to now having to go and build this initial investment team in DC and unlike an unlikely geography for a private equity firm at that time. Um, and how were you later able to attract investors to the Carlisle Group? Well, I uh, wouldn't say it was easy at the beginning because there no, no there were no private equity firms or buyout firms in Washington then. It was seen as a government city. I argued to our investors that we understood companies heavily affected by government regulation better than people in New York or Los Angeles did and maybe that resonated, but I I had been a um, you know follower of government, so I was able to recruit people into the firm who had very prominent government positions, and they were draws for for lunches or dinners. So I was able to recruit Frank Carlucci, Jim Baker, former President Bush forty one, um, John Major, former British Prime Minister, mm -hmm. Arthur Levitt, the former SEC Chairman, Richard Darman, the former head of OMB, and with these kind of people in the firm. Uh, I was able to hold a dinner or lunch with where I would invite investors or potential investors, and they would want to hear from Baker or, or Bush. And it, it helped get me in front of people. But on the end, you have to have a reasonably good track record. And I recruited people in the firm who knew something about investing, and we had a reasonably good track record at the beginning. But it was not easy to raise the initial capital, for sure. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Jim Baker. I, I have to disclose that being in Houston um, and an avid 
goer of the Memorial Park here in Houston. I don't know if you are familiar with the Memorial Park. I, I run into Jim Baker quite a bit. Uh, in fact, uh, I've run into him in the last five years frequently. And every time I saw him, I stopped and shook his hand and said hello. So I can call him my friend. I actually asked him to join my show here. He told me, Najib, do you think I, I, I want to do podcasts at my age or I, I'd rather be duck hunting or quail hunting? So um, Jim Baker, if you're watching, I, I hope that you reconsider uh, coming to my podcast. This program is in partnership with Nash. For more information, please click on the link below. Did you know that your company's most valuable assets are the knowledge stored in your experts' minds and the content they've created over the years? These assets form the foundation of successful teams. When experts go on vacation, move teams, go on parental leave, retire or resign, your teams find themselves in the dark, resulting in onboarding delays, quality loss, burnout, and drop in customer satisfaction. Nesh revolutionizes this for you. Nesh turns subject matter expertise into subject matter avatars to preserve this knowledge. Nesh connects all of your company's content, turning treasure troves of data and knowledge from your experts' minds into precise searchable answers. Nesh is made for simplicity, where you can ask a question in natural language, it's just like interacting with a colleague. She improves continuously to become the ultimate subject matter expert for your organization. With Nesh, use your knowledge as a superpower to bring innovative products to market, grow business blazingly fast, and provide an extraordinary experience to customers. Unleash the power of your enterprise's most valuable asset with 24 seven available subject matter avatars. So the next question, um... What do you believe to be your greatest contribution to private equity, David? Well, I'm not sure I made any great contribution to private equity, but um, probably the thing that people will say about me is that I developed the idea of having multiple funds within a private equity organization, not just buyout funds, and that I globalized the business. Uh, Carlisle, in the early 1990s, developed multiple funds, not just buyout funds. And we took advantage of our brand name, and then we took to sell funds in areas that we had not yet been involved in. And then we globalized up to building funds in Europe, Asia, Japan, uh, Africa, the Middle East, and so forth. So institutionalizing it was one way to look at it. As I helped to institutionalize uh, private equity by making it a big enough business so you could really have a publicly traded vehicle coming out of it. Right. And a lot of other funds have followed suit after and you. They have, and they've done a better job in some cases than we did. So, yes, there are a number of firms, Blackstone, Apollo, KKR, TPG, among others, are global and, and, and involved in many different disciplines. Correct. So let's jump onto the book now. So this is your new book, How to Invest, that... Is not yet out, correct? This is a this is an advanced copy that I received. When does it come out? September the thirteenth. Okay, so just a couple of weeks from now. So I've had the pleasure of reading this book, and I, I would like to talk to you about this book. I'd like to thank your team behind the scenes uh, okay. first for 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 setting this up. So in your book, you preface quote: "Much of life simply revolves around predicting the future, and then taking actions that reflect the view of that future." Like everyone, I have made some good and bad predictions about the future and taken some smart and not so smart actions based on those predictions. If you could point out one common mistake investors make, what would it be? Well, what I was saying at the beginning is that life is all about predicting the future, but that the investing world is also about predicting the future, but it's a very precisely measured way of predicting the future so that you, you can measure your profitability and so forth in ways you can't quite measure other decisions in life you might have made about predicting the future. Um, so um, I would say uh, um, in terms of predicting the future and the mistakes that people often make about predicting the future is the biggest, com the most common mistake that investors make is when the markets go down, they get out of the markets or they, they just take their money back and the markets go up, they decide to rush into the markets. And typically, they get into the wrong time and they get out of the right, the wrong time. It's much better when markets are in trouble to then invest. Uh, right. You may not get the absolute bottom of the market, but you're probably likely to get near the bottom. 
And the same is true when the markets are very strong. You're probably not, you know, going to top get the topping exactly right, but probably that's a good time to get out. Okay. Now, if you're building a portfolio that consists of mainstream, alternative, and cutting edge investors, categories you define in your book, which investors would you select in each category and why? Well, clearly, uh, the people who are in the alternative category, people in buyouts, growth capital, venture capital, have done extraordinarily well over the last 20, 30 years or so, getting outsized returns by any measurement. Um, if you, But it has some more risk associated with it. So if you don't have a tolerance for some risk, I would say, you know, just stick with traditional, uh, you know, corporate bonds and, um, and municipal bonds, perhaps, and then also equities. Um, if you want higher rates of return, but you're prepared to take the risk, alternatives would be probably a better uh, opportunity for you. But then I also mentioned, as you say, cutting edge things. Things are um, not have been around that long, but people are really um, happy to invest in them in some cases. Some people criticize these areas, but they like are- Like SPACs correct. and cryptocurrencies. Correct. Cryptocurrency is, is heavily criticized by some of the authors, some of the people I interviewed in the book, and some people love it. Um, the same is true of SPACs. Um, SPACs have had real problems lately. Cryptocurrency has had some real problems lately. I don't think either are going away, just like I think ESG is not going away. I put that in the book as well, talking about that as a cutting edge type of investment. Given all the economic cycles you've encountered and lived through in the last few decades, what type of asset class or investor type would you say outperformed during these cycles relative to others? Well, in this cycle, uh, clearly uh, value investing tends to do well because as prices have come down, value investors are able to come back in and buy things that were used to sell for a dollar. Now they're selling for 50 cents and they can buy them at you know 50 cents and they might be worth a dollar again in the future. So value investors probably are in pretty good shape these days. Okay. And out of all the inter investors you interviewed in your book, how would you sum up the best investment advice they've shared with you? Well, the best investment advice is to make sure you know what you're doing, read everything you can about the opportunity, make sure you have good partners associated with your people you're working with, and don't put too much of your money in any one uh, investment or any one category. Diversify. Good answer. Going back to Jim Baker again. So in your book, you quote, prior preparation prevents poor performance. You mentioned in your book as an aphorism drilled in by former Secretary of State Jim Baker's father to him when he was younger. How do you apply this aphorism to investing? Well, I think it's uh, very applicable because I think if you're going to be a good investor and the people I interview in the book are all great investors, they all really prepare. They know what they're doing. They read a lot. They don't just do things off the top of their head. And so I think you can't do too much preparation. Obviously, you can't get um, you know, paralyzed by too much preparation. Sometimes I get investment committee memos that could be two or 300 pages, an over analysis perhaps. But I, I do think that in the end, you really need to know what you're doing. And the best way to do that is prepare, read, make sure you've talked to experts, make sure you know everything about the investment you're about to do. Okay. Well, you're a great philanthropist. Um, and, you know, in this book, you've interviewed dozens of investors. Would you say that philanthropy is a natural act for most successful investors you met or interviewed, or is it a rare trait? It's actually very common because clearly if you're in the investing business, aside from people investing endowments or college endowments or, or things like that, people make a great deal of money in this business. And when you have a good deal of money, you, you, know, you can spend it on yourself and buy boats and planes and so forth. But in the end, I think that most of the great investors are less interested in in, in those kind of uh, uh, additional material assets than they are in just continuing the game of wits, winning. And then ultimately, they realize they have so much money, they want to give it away. So uh, virtually all of the people I interviewed today have extensive philanthropic commitments. And I, I think that you've uh, influenced that uh, in many ways. Um, so thank you as an American to another American. You know, uh, your work uh, in philanthropy is quite commendable, sir. Thank you. Now, are you worried now that we're in a recession or is it less worrisome to you because private equity can buy, can buy at the bottom? Or would you say we're in a banana? 
Yeah. Um, on a recession, right now, I don't think we're in a recession. We've had two consecutive quarters of negative growth, and you could say that means in a recession, but there are other indicators would not suggest that. Unemployment is still relatively low, now 3.7%. Uh, I'd say retail sales are in reasonably good shape. Tax receipts are in pretty good shape. So I don't think we're in a recession. And the third quarter is likely to have a positive growth of maybe 1.5%, 1.6%. So I think we are um, avoiding a recession currently. But there's no doubt that when you increase interest rates by the level that the Fed is thinking of doing, and it's already done, it's more likely than not that you'll have what's called a hard landing, which is a recession. Uh, most of the times when the Fed has increased interest rates over the last 40 or 50 years, eventually it produces a recession at some point. Uh, maybe the Fed is more skilled than it used to be. I hope so. And maybe we'll avoid a, a recession. Clearly, we have a lot of money jostling around in the economy because of, uh, of the COVID expenditures. And maybe that's going to change things. But normally, you would say we're probably heading into something close to a recession. But right now, our indicators, our economic indicators do not suggest we're about to go into a recession anytime soon. Okay. So let's say Jay Powell called you and said, David, you've been around for a while and seen a cycle or two. You've also been my boss at one point when I worked at Carlisle. What should I do? Should I keep raising rates to reduce inflation? Or should I worry that it will produce a recession? What would you advise him? This program is in partnership with Crow. For more information, please click on the link below. fights uncertainty. Crow will help you embrace it. Embrace volatility. Crow. As a general rule of thumb, it is thought that unemployment and a recession is worse than higher inflation often. But I think in the end, the main task of the Federal Reserve is to worry about the strength and viability of our currency and to deal with inflation. So I think that I would probably err on the side of worrying about inflation than I would about unemployment at the moment. And so I probably would keep interest rates high and continue to increase them to the point where it's clear we are um, able to get um, economic indicators in a, in a better shape than they are today. Okay. Um, your book is titled How to Invest. Now, if a fledgling investor is trying to make a mark in the investment world, how would you advise him or her how not to invest? Well, I would advise somebody to pick a specialty, make it his or her own, know that area better than anybody else, make some investments there, hopefully do well in it, and then basically try to make yourself seem like if you're not a, actually are a great investor in that one area. Make one area your own. It's hard to be a great investor in every area. And so find something you know well, study it. And, and make sure it's something that you, you're you interested in as well. So you want to spend time on it and then try to you know do well in that area and then let people know about it. And then ultimately, you'll increasingly get investors to invest with you. Okay. Also in your book, you talk about the importance of humility, the ability to lead and to inspire others orally in written form or by example. You, you also emphasize the importance of resilience that's needed to be a good investor. At what different stages of your life did you acquire these values and principles? Well, I'd say uh, resilience is something I got when I kind of lost my job at the White House and I had to go back and remake my career. In the early days of Carlisle, it was difficult. I wasn't sure we'd really make it. Um, and so I had to be resilient in that, rega or that regard as well. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, in the end, if you're going to be a good leader or a good investor, you have to fail along the way make some mistakes, learn from it, pick yourself up, get back into the arena. And uh, that's what I try to do. But obviously, other people have done it better than I have. Okay. In your past interviews, you once used the quote, if you can't stand the heat, you got to get out of the kitchen. What is the backstory of this quote? Well, I think that quote really comes probably from Harry Truman, maybe. But um, it's an old quote. I think so Harry Truman may have said it many times. And the essence of it is, if if the publicity or the uh, uh, potential losses or other things that come about from failing um, is something that you can't really deal with, then you probably have to do something different. So people that um, are resilient and can deal with adverse situations 
can stand the heat and they can stay in the kitchen. But now some people don't have that ability. Okay, so final question, sir. If, let's say we, we developed a good rapport relationship and if I offered you to run your political campaign, would you consider running for president? I think uh, right now the world could certainly use a private equity person with the great skills that private <laughs> equity have, uh, but I suspect there's not likely to be a private equity person elected president in the, in the near future, though my former partner, Glenn Youngkin, I'm, t- I'm told is, uh, you know, thinking about it and he, he'd be uh, somebody that has an extensive background in private equity. But uh, you never know. If you were my campaign manager, I might be able to overcome being in the private equity business and maybe I would win. Who knows? Who knows? Well, with that, sir, thank you so much for your time. I know you're an extremely busy person. So uh, thank you again. Thanks a lot. My pleasure.